for this evening. We thank you for your goodness and Lord for this special time of year where we turn to you and just thank you for, uh, for all the provision that you give to us. And we pray, Lord, for your wisdom tonight. Father, help us to learn and help us to move forward for the city of Lancaster. Be with um, this group of uh, commissioners and also with the public as we work together to make this a better city. Have your will be done and we'll be sure to thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You join me, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Sperky? Here. Irvin? Here. Hey, Cobb. Here. Jay Cobbs. Here. Vice Chair Smith. Here. Chairman Vos. Here. Commissioner Malley. Absent. We have a quorum. Thank you. Public business from the floor. If an individual <clears throat> is unable to stay through the entire meeting due to extenuating circumstances, a total of 10 minutes is, author is uh, provided at this time during which input may be given regarding agenda items. Any person who would like to address the commission is requested to complete a speaker's card uh, and give it to the recording secretary. Uh, speaker cards are available at the rear of the council chambers. Individual speakers would be allotted two minutes for this purpose. Any speakers? No. The purpose of tonight's meeting is uh, to complete review of the draft general po plan policy document, begin review and discussion of the general plan land use alternatives. In addition to the current adopted land use map, the Planning Commission will consider two land use alternatives de developed for input received at community land use workshops and monthly meetings of the General Plan Citizens Advisory Committee during 2007. Uh, this special meeting will also coincide with release of the draft program environmental impact report for the new general plan and will begin the 60-day public comment period for the uh, pro programmed environmental impact report. So, Mr. Ludicky. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the Commission, I, I think the first thing that we want to go over this evening, uh, which we were unable to do last time, uh, several meetings ago, uh, as we had gone through some various aspects of the policy document, um, there were some questions regarding specific action 18.2.1C relating to infill housing. Um, and uh, you know what exactly that meant, or what staff was was envisioning in terms of that of that uh, specific action. Uh, and to refresh your memory, what that would do uh, is allow for uh, the city to amend the zoning ordinance uh, to encourage um, the development of housing on infill sites within the city, um, and allow those projects to to achieve a higher density um, without having to go through the process of, of a general plan amendment and a zone change. And what's contained in that specific action is uh, indicating uh, a density of up to eight units to the acre maximum. Um, and I, I think the question, as I recall, is how does how, what does that look like or what, what sort of thing are we envisioning? So I, I do have a presentation to, to kind of go through with you and you can get an idea of what staff was envisioning. Um, I've also spent a little bit of time kind of, kind of thinking through the city right now. And, and I think there are a couple of examples that you can actually go look at that um, – you know they're not recently done, but I think it would give you an idea of the type of thing that that we would look to encourage on infill type situations. So, all right, please proceed. Thank you. When a 
stand here, hopefully I can see the screen better and, and talk to you. Um, one of the things that we have, have done in our discussion with uh, particularly um, people from the development community is that they would like the opportunity uh, to look at providing a, a little bit more diversity in the, in the types of housing that's available uh, within, our, within our city. And one of, the, one of the techniques that they've looked at um, is doing infill type projects that are a little bit more dense than the typical single family subdivision, but are still in many ways uh, essentially a single family or ownership type product. Uh, and, and what the, the idea of the specific action is, is to allow a, a, a project applicant in that kind of a situation to um, approach the city through the conditional use permit RPD process, um, but not put them through the process of having to do a general plan amendment and a zone change. In the current way that the general plan is drafted, I think, uh, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the maximum density in the urban residential zone is what, about 6.5 units to the acre? Uh, and, and we're looking at an increase of about a unit and a half per acre. Th that may seem small, but in many cases it's the difference um, from what we've been able to tell between what makes one of these projects viable and what may not make it viable. Um, and some of the examples that we're looking at, um, there's a project that has been built in Palmdale by uh, uh, KB Home. Uh, it's at about seven units to the acre. And uh, if you look at the, the layout of the site plan, it's actually very similar in, in terms of appearance from the site uh, to what you might see at the College Terrace Condominium project that's located, um, uh, integrated pretty well actually within the, the College Terrace neighborhood along 30th Street West. Um, this is visually kind of the example that that, uh, that project would have. At about seven units to the acre, uh, you're looking at a project that contains, um, you know, a, a, a little bit of a different look but at the same time uh, relies on the rear loading of garages, um, has a, a frontage area that's largely porch or, or something of that type, uh, more of a friendly face, if you will. Um, yard areas are provided. Um, they're not as large, obviously, as you would have on a larger lot, but the compensation for that is, is common space. Now, can you put all that grass in anymore? Probably not. But it's the idea that what you're doing in these kinds of projects is you're trading off private space for more common space. And I think it's, it's important to note that if someone was, it were, were to come into our community now and look at wanting to live in that kind of an environment, we really don't have that choice available for them. It's not out there. Um, and we have a, a number of people, I talk to people, you know, on a fairly regular basis who say, w why is the city so opposed to these kinds of things? And I say, well, I, I don't know that it's, it's, you know, deliberate opposition. I, I think it may just not be uh, maybe our regulatory framework keeping up with the types of things that, that we would uh, like to see, that people say, hey, that could be a positive addition to our community. This is some of the interior examples, some of the floor plans um, as an example. Now, this is another project. Now, this is obviously denser than what we would look at as, as an approach. But this is actually in the area of Brea, for anyone who's familiar with that community that is in what they call their downtown Brea area. It's done at about 11 units to the acre. We actually took um, members of the Citizens Advisory Committee and, and I think the previous Planning Commission to, to this as an example. Uh, here's some specific uh, information on it. You know, the, the lot sizes are 2,500 to 3,000 square feet, the density about 11 units to the acre. Um, it's located immediately adjacent to their more dense um, downtown area. If you look at the project, it's actually kind of to the north side, the, the upper area of the screen. Um, the downtown Brea area, which includes um, a number of, of areas that are, that are pretty walkable, uh, has a movie theater complex and some other things, are, are immediately adjacent to this project. And, and this is kind of the example of the feel that that project has uh, in it. 
You get an idea of the street look on the left side. Um, you get an idea, once again, the rear loading of the garages, as you can see in the upper right. The, the area um, down at the, at the lower right is another one of these common areas. This is more of a courtyard, uh, probably more the type of design you'd see in a denser project, as I said. But, but this, once again, is kind of the feel and the approach. And, and I think when we took uh, members of our community through these through these uh, areas, they were they were quite pleased with the way that it looked. And once again, you know, it's a little bit denser than what we would see um, in our in our situation. But it's another example of the type of an infill project that would work. Um, interestingly, although it's right near a movie theater and there's quite a bit of activity in the downtown Brea location. Um, I, I actually asked one of the residents, I said, what do you like about living here? And their comment was that it's very quiet. Um, you wouldn't think that being a block away from all that activity, but it, it is interestingly very quiet. And once again, some examples of, of things. Now, Copper Valley up in Hanford, this is probably more of a, of a typical smaller lot arrangement. Um, does not have the rear loaded garage uh, arrangement um, but but once again hits at about seven units to the acre uh, its design once again as you can see relies on these smaller lots but they're but they're interconnected with with this um, pedestrian and and central open space area um, what what the uh, development community has told us is that people who choose this kind of of living arrangement. Sometimes they do it for cost, sometimes they do it because they don't want to take care of much yard, but they do like to have the, the trade-off ability. One of the things that they enjoy having is that larger open space area near them. Um, kind of a, once again, a, a site plan view of this um, and, and kind of an example of how the units set up on the property itself. And once again, very conventional in the sense that the garages load off of the front of the project an example of some of the the architecture that was proposed in it um, this is you know was still basically somewhat under construction and recently done at this point in time but you can kind of see the the effect of this now I think there's a huge difference in design when you have garages on the front versus not but you, you don't always have that that option available to you. Rear loading garages, in some ways, uh, has some advantages, and there's some people who don't care for that. But once again, you know the the central open space area, as you can see, some of the units still under construction, um, and you know it would be interesting to kind of look at some of these as as time goes by. But it does meet that same sort of approach. It's it's a good alternative for someone who may not want as much space. Um, and the question, I guess, is, is there anything really wrong with trying to integrate that, provided you get the design uh, well done within a, within a single family area? And, and the answer, quite frankly, from my standpoint, is I don't think so. I, I think, as, as is often the case, the devil may be in the details. But that's the reason that what we're recommending in the specific action is that the amendment be made into the zoning code. It still requires going through a, uh, a uh, entitlement process that's through the planning commission. So, so neighbors, uh, neighboring property owners, do get the chance to have input into it. Um, uh, but I think it's something that we should look at, particularly if we want to try to encourage some of the more efficient use of, of what you might call some of our more skipped over parcels. And I, I can think of areas where these types of projects would probably fit pretty nicely as long as you design them well. And I think another important thing, uh, and that's why I kind of direct you to, to the, the College Terrace condominium area or even if you look at the housing area, uh, when we were here a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of people from the, the area on the south side of the, the Greek Orthodox Church. But those units are probably about twice the density of the units immediately to the east. But what's good about that project is it's tied in, it's integrated with the streets in the area, 
and it seems to fit pretty nicely. I think you get into a bigger problem where you start isolating these projects and you know walling them off from everything. I, I think that one of the things we would look at trying to do is to integrate to the best extent that we can some of these these infill projects, and that's why I'm suggesting that uh, as you contemplate this, it may not be a bad idea to take a look at how college terraces, condominiums do tie in with that. The street system, you know, doesn't stop abruptly. It, it ties in with the single family areas to the south and to the east. So that's kind of a, a brief rundown of the type of thing we would like to encourage. Eight units to the acre I think is a reasonable number. Um, I think when you start getting beyond that, you, you start getting changes in design that may not be, you know, something that we want to encourage just you know, uh, through through that process, but I think eight units to the acre may do well. So All right, thank you. There may be questions. Anyone have them? So, do you see integrating this um, land use type, density type? I guess not land use. The density within our land use designations into what? Designations. The R1 I think it would go in. Yeah, it would go into the to the. Um, it would go into the UR designation, um, which which is essentially our single family residential zones. Um, one thing that we might want to consider is in areas that that are zoned, say R15,000 or or R10, because those are normally transitional type areas for us. Um, we may not want to put that same provision in there, but in R7,000 area where the normal density of a conventional single family development is four and a half units to the acre, uh, I think it's something worth worth exploring, particularly if you have a project that's at about seven units to the acre. I, I think it may, it, it may in fact work well and may allow us to efficiently use some of the land where infrastructure is already provided, services are already available. Um, that might otherwise continue to be a passed over, passed over um, that's the only, parcel. That's the only ur ur urban designation you see it uh, yeah. fitting into? Yeah, uh, because by the time you, you, you look into the, uh, um, you know, the higher density, obviously it doesn't, you've already got the provision and the ability to do it. But I think what we're really trying to do is say, is there a reason that sites have been passed over? Um, and is there a way to try to encourage a more efficient use of that? Would you consider some uh, minimum yields then, or minimum acreage to produce a? Uh, a, a, a yeah, yield? I, I think I think you'd have to get there to to do that. I, I mean, I think if you're doing less than five acres, it starts to get a little hard to do it effectively. But once again, it kind of depends on how the the property is situated and, and what it looks like. Um, so these are really a, a planned development sort of approach then? Yeah. So you would see it coming, bef these types of projects coming before the commission? Yes. Uh, through a planned through development a, or as a conditional use permit? Through an RPD process, which under our current code requires a conditional use permit, and, and I think would be the appropriate mechanism to, to do it. However, uh, other density housing does not require a conditional use permit, is that no, correct? it doesn't. So then, so then we have R1 without a conditional use permit and, and heavier density without it, but this requires them? Well, I don't I, see that. I, 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 I think the reason that, that we would look at doing it this way is because if you have an area that's, that's an infill site, say surrounded by, by an existing single family neighborhood or something, um, you do want to, you know, allow those people the opportunity to comment on what's happening there. I think it's a good middle ground. I, I think if you don't do it by some kind of a, uh, of a of an entitlement process of that type, then um, you may have a, a situation where you have a developer who may not address as readily uh, issues around them. Um, However, if they're aware that they need to convince seven members, or at least four of seven members of a planning commission, that that this is a good project, uh, it's valuable for the community, it's a positive influence on it, uh, I think that 
Uh, it's, a, it's a different issue than someone who's simply coming in and, and going through the, the standard procedure. I would point out, you know, even though you don't get a lot of control over the architectural features in a typical single family subdivision, the subdivision itself still comes through uh, your process. So I, I don't know that there's a whole lot that's different about the process that they would have to do. Simply seeing, no doubt. Yeah, that they would have to show. You allude to an infill project being adjacent to existing development, but couldn't there be an infill project that is not adjacent to? Sure. I mean, it would be, uh, that's possible as it's well. It's certainly right? possible, yes. So. All right, thank you. Anyway, for your consideration. September we started this series of special meetings um, and we started the uh, uh, special meetings with a, a review of the general plan citizens advisory committees development of the um, review of the goals and objectives and development of the um, of the general plan land use alternatives there was of course of several other special meetings uh, leading up to tonight we uh, the Commission has had the opportunity to, to go through the policy document and review uh, the uh, goals, the objectives, um, and policies and action programs of that document. And we begin to see, receive uh, information from you regarding your review of that. And uh, what we'd like to do tonight is uh, go to the next step of this process and introduce for discussion the uh, land use alternatives that uh, have been uh, uh, analyzed by the Environmental Impact Report, which you, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, tonight also is the beginning of the 60-day public review for that document. So what we want to do tonight is, is introduce the alternatives to you and um, uh, give uh, you, you the opportunity to begin to discuss those. Get the right mechanism here. There we go. And what we'd like to do is um, before we get into the actual review of the land use alternatives, we'd like to give you a little bit of a historical perspective on the development of the general plan. Because the general plan goes back, this process goes back many years. The city has been through this process uh, three times in the last couple of decades. And I think that giving you a historic, historical perspective of where we've come from is a good lead in to where uh, the process is now. So we'd like to take a few moments before we get into the actual alternatives and go back and kind of review um, some of the uh, evolution of the general plan uh, for the city. It, the, the original general plan was adopted in 1980. At that time, the city was 37 square miles in area. We had an existing population of 48,000. And the population projection, the general plan horizon, the original horizon was out to the year 2000 at that time. It was a 20-year horizon, very similar to what we've done with the, the, the other general plan programs that we've been through. And at that time, that, that projection was 105,712. And that was, incidentally, that was a mid-projection for that time. And incidentally, it was based on development of the uh, Palmdale International Airport. Well, actually, we came fairly close to that. That, that really was the one time when the population projection really came out fairly close by the time we got to 2000, but it was for other reasons beside obviously the development of the international airport, which really didn't happen. <clears throat> At that time, the two major land uses on the general plan, that original general plan, were rural residential and urban residential, and rural residential equaled about 65% of the, of the total land Within, within the general plan at that time, while urban residential was about 28%. Then in 
During the 1990s decade, population increased between 1980 and 1990. We saw a 102% increase to over 97,000 people. We had a building boom that occurred during the later half of the decade, particularly in the residential sectors. We began to see concerns regarding resource limitations. During that same period, essentially between 1988 and 1992, the city annexed approximately 38 square miles of new territory to the city. And part of this was brought on by a myriad of general plan amendments that we began to receive in these outlying areas on the east side and the west side of the city. And so there was this process that led up to the 1992 general plan update. This map shows the city boundaries as they were in 1981, and then it shows in the orange areas all of the annexed area that occurred within that four-year period. Like I said, most of those amendments that came in at that time came in on the west side and the east side on those orange areas and were taken in as part of the general plan process that occurred at that time. The 1992 general plan, as I mentioned, the base population was 97,000. The 2010 projection, which we now had gone 10 years further into the future, the SCAG projection at the time was for a population by that year of 234,228, which would have represented a 140% increase. The new land use plan added over 26,000 acres of urban residential land. That's R7,000, R10,000 densities. It's approximately 39 square miles of residential area. Again, the plan called for a long-term projection of 234,000 people, but the plan itself would have allowed for 612,000, or 2.6 times the projected need by that year, by actually it should be 2010. At the time, the general plan, the residential land extended from 110th Street West to almost 110th Street East. Comparing the 1980 general plan to the 1992 general plan, now there was 58% of the total land area was urban residential. Rural residential was reduced to 11%. So again, those were, and then the larger industrial area shows the Fox Field annexations that occurred in the early 1980s in that 1992 pie chart. So a tremendous switch from rural residential to urban residential land under the 1992 general plan. During the 1990s decade, in fact right around the time that the general plan was adopted in 1992, the economy began to tank, and there was a drastic fall off in construction, particularly residential construction. There's a dramatic increase in foreclosures. There are going, again, heightened concerns over available resources and the cost of supporting growth. At this time, we also implemented the urban structure program, which was the city's fee, new development impact fee program that tried to assess or assessed new development impact fees for all types of development in an attempt to try to transfer some of the cost for infrastructure and services to new development. And again, at this time, the city began to see, or shortly after this, that there were problems with the 92 general plan and that it wasn't supportable, particularly with the amount of residential land that had been designated under that general plan. And also, SCAG had begun to scale back its projections. So about four years after, in fact in the fall of 1996, the city undertook to update the general plan again to try to address some of the problems that came out of the 92 general plan process. SCAG, first of all, had revised their 2010 projections from 234,000 down to 212, so there was even less of a need for large amounts of residential land. The new population projection, the horizon now went out to 2020, and the new projection for that time was 293,000, or about 294,000 people. 
Under the new general plan, the 97 general plan, land use was scaled back, or the urban residential land use was scaled back by 12,298 acres, or almost 19 square miles. So basically just pulled it back in and, and converted it back to rural residential. This was four years after the 1992 general plan. But in that process, there were islands of residential that were left that had entitlements, particularly on the west side, and those are, are there today. You can look at the, the, the current adopted general plan and see where those islands of urban residential are, pretty much surrounded by rural residential land. They, they had entitlements of one form or the other, so they were left in place. Um, the, the United States General Plan first introduced uh, some fairly stringent annexation policies. Um, we begin to see uh, uh, more conservative and sustainable development policies introduced into the policy document at that time. And also during that time, the community form section of the general plan was added, which was the kind of the beginnings of the community design, design uh, direction for the general plan. Now comparing the uh, pie charts for the 92 general plan to the 1997 general plan, rural residential went back to 37%. And urban residential was about 35%, so they're fairly balanced by that time. <clears throat> 2000s decade, uh, as we all know, um, we had a, a population increase of about 21%, about 22% between 1990, uh, our, our, our 1990 and 2000, as compared to that 102% that happened between 1980 and 1990. So there's a fall off in population growth. We had a, a resurgence in the economy and a new building boom in the first half of the decade, and then a sharp downturn in the second half of the decade, and uh, a rise in, in foreclosures again to record levels. Um, and again, uh, increasing concerns over resource availability, uh, conservation, and, and issues of sustainability, such as water and, and other resources, and, and the amount that is available to support future growth. And uh, a new factor that came in uh, relating to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, which we're beginning to have to deal with uh, new state and federal regulations and legislation regarding, regarding uh, uh, those concerns. And under the new general plan program, I guess SCAG once again scaled back their growth projections. This has been a continual process for the last two decades, scaling back the growth projections. So the 2010 projections originally were 234,000. They're now uh, at 168,000 currently uh, for that 2010 year. Now we're probably we're under 150,000 according to the state right now, so I doubt we're going to make that by 2010. Um, the 2020 projection got scaled back to 215, and we know now because they've released the 2008 RTP that even the current figure that we're using for this general plan is being scaled back. So, you know, we this is a continual process, and we know that if that's the case, then then the the amount of residential land that is the, the, uh, uh, that is needed to support the future growth is even less than what. Um, uh, is, a bit, uh, is currently under the, the three alternatives that you're looking at. And the, the new general plan, uh, and I've emphasized this before, is a community-based plan, general plan program. What we mean by that is that we spent the first two years of this program, we're really in the third year of the general plan program right now, the first two years were spent on community outreach. The first year was just uh, uh, visioning, workshops, uh, stakeholder meetings, various uh, community outreach functions. The second year was spent in more workshops, land use workshops, and uh, monthly meetings of the General Plan Citizens Advisory Committee in order to review the goals and objectives of the policy document and to um, develop the land use alternatives that we'll be reviewing tonight. So really, that's, that's what this we set out to do. That's, that was the direction we were given to make this a community-based plan. To, make, to get to involve the community in this plan, find out what the community wanted for the future of Lancaster. The plans we've mentioned before, um, uh, all three of the alternatives uh, uh, proposed to accommodate growth to within the urbanizing area. And again, the urbanizing area is nothing more than the interface between urban residential or urban density development 
and rural residential density developments. That's what that is, the interface between those two. And it's the same in all three of the alternatives. The new general plan, the, the, at least the, the plan that was selected by the General Plan Citizens Advisory Committee would take additional steps towards creating a sustainable long-term development plan, uh, which really started with the adoption of the 1997 general plan. Um, the 97 general plan policies regarding conser uh, conservation and sustainable development have been expanded under the current policy document or the draft policy document that you've been reviewing. Uh, community design uh, subsection has replaced the former community forum section. Um, and um, so I'd that, that in 1997, the current adopted plan was, it was selected as the, as the most desirable plan. Now it's the no project alternative. And under the, when you look at your environmental impact report, you'll see in many ways it's the least desirable environmentally. And now the preferred plan tends to be the most desirable, at least under the environmental analysis. So what this indicates is this is another step forward from where we were in 1997 with the adopted general plan. And that's why we're going through this process, this, this, this review, this historical review of the general plan process to kind of show you how this process has evolved. Before you go to the next step, there may mm -hmm. be some questions from the board. Okay. And we're there. Go ahead. Questions? Apparently not. Go ahead. Okay, what I'd like to do next is just do a brief recap of what we really went into in more detail uh, with the Commission during the very first special meeting when we went through the General Plan Citizens Advisory Committee role in all of this and just re kind of recap the three alternatives and what they are. First of all, they have the nope. these are the three that I'm showing you um, that, that have been analyzed under the um, uh, environmental program with the exception, exception of the focus growth alternative which, which dropped out of the process once the, the preferred plan was selected by the citizens committee. So first the no project alternative, again, that is a, uh, that's the adopted general plan, that's what we have in place right now, that has to be um, um, under, under CEQA, it has to be uh, reviewed as one of the alternatives that you analyze under the environmental process. And under the no project, project alternative, the current pattern of development would continue. A single family residential would uh, comprise about 91% of the residential land uses within the city. Um, the underserved areas we men mentioned that one of the that you know that 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 when we adopted the 97 general plan, the outlying areas did were not balanced; they were predominantly uh, urban residential. That would remain, um, and uh, automobile would continue to be the primary mode of transportation under the no project alternative. There would be no introduction of mixed use land use designations under that particular plan, at least not as it would be adopted under the under the general plan update process. Then uh, the, one of the uh, two alternatives that were developed uh, during the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, Citizens Advisory Committee process was the balanced land use alternative. And the idea behind the balanced land use alternative was to promote a balance of land use distribution of, of different land uses, particularly in the outlying areas where, like I, I mentioned before, we had predominantly in some areas 95 percent uh, urban residential land, and that's, that made up the land use in those areas. So the idea behind the balanced land use plan was to go back and try to uh, distribute uh, uh, land uses throughout the plan to create balances so that people could meet their, could get their daily needs met without having to travel long distances to do so. Um, the balanced plan assumes a uh, moderate expansion of the urban core and incorporates some mixed-use development. So it introduces some mixed-use development and it also promotes some increase in transit use. And then the second alternative that was developed was the focus growth alternative. And the focus growth alternative 
close a full range of housing opportunities at various choices and densities. That doesn't mean that the other two alternatives don't do this too. It's just that this does it more than the other two. It promotes it more. All of these things are promoted more under the, the focus growth alternative. Encourages higher density, intensity, mixed use uh, development within key urban uh, infill areas. Promotes the revitalization of urban areas and the reuse of infrastructure. And encourages the development of compact, walkable neighborhoods and increased transit use. Now, what happened to get to the preferred, the GPAC preferred plan, uh, just in a, in a nutshell, as we've discussed before, is that the committee went back and examined both the balanced alternative and the focused growth alternative, and they actually ended up blending elements of both in order to produce the, 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 the preferred plan. So when you look at the preferred plan, not only do you see mixed use uh, as being a, a predominant land use in the central area of the city, but there was also an attempt to balance the outlying areas of the urbanizing area in order to provide the benefits of the, of the, balance, the balanced alternative. So that's really what, uh, what happened in the course of going from the focus growth to the preferred plan, is the focus growth simply they went back and incorporated uh, elements of the balanced growth alternative into that to create the preferred plan. Now what I'd like to do in, uh, is what we've done is we've actually divided the city up into three areas and, and uh, west, central, and east. And what I'm going to present to you is a side-by-side -side comparison of three alternatives that have been analyzed under the environmental impact report. And, and essentially what we're looking at is a, a swath, and this doesn't cover the entire city, but it, cover, it covers uh, basically the urbanizing area. Uh, and it covers uh, the first, the, the west uh, Lancaster map covers from 90th Street West to 40th Street West, and from Avenue H down to Avenue M. And what we're looking at is the no project on the left, and the balanced land use alternative in the center, and then the GPAC preferred plan on the right-hand side. I'm going to kind of point out, and, and, and by the way, this is not meant to be a comprehensive review of the maps. What I'm really trying to do is just kind of give you an overview tonight of where the changes occurred, because they really aren't really extensive. And, and so, uh, but at this scale, it's very difficult to see all of the detail. I understand that. So really, this is an overview of where the, where the predominant changes between the alternatives occurred. On the balanced uh, land use plan, you can see that if you look at, compare the two maps, you can see where uh, commercial areas were added in. It's pretty easy to pick those out. They're in the red. You can also see on here some areas where um, uh, multiple family was added to the map, multiple family designations. Um, and also it shows uh, the parks that are under the, the parks master plan. Now the reason the parks are not on the no project alternative, I think I mentioned this before, but no project alternative is the adopted map. And the parks master plan was adopted after, uh, of course, the 97 general plan was in place. If we were to go forward with the no project alternative, we would amend the no project to include the, the master plan park sites. So essentially, the park sites are equivalent on all three, even though they're not shown on the no project. So essentially, that's what that, that really is the difference between the no project and the balanced growth on the on the uh, on the west side. Is that there's a series of commercial sites that were added in, some multiple family sites. There was even some reduction of multiple family around, suggested reduction of multiple family around the prison site, because there was quite a bit of, of multiple family at those locations. And then a, a distributing of, of, of that multiple family into other locations. Uh, an additional school site here. And that's and that essentially is the difference between the balance and the no project on the west side. Now the no pro on the, the GPAC preferred plan, the difference between the GPAC preferred plan in this area and the balanced uh, land use plan is that there are not as many 
commercial sites. There are some who are added in, but because uh, more of the population under the, under the preferred plan would be located in the central area, the theory is that you would need less of those commercial sites because you would have less growth on the outside. You wouldn't limit growth, you wouldn't keep growth from occurring, but you would just have less growth occurring theoretically under, under, under the preferred plan because more of that population would locate into the central core. So some of the commercial sites are shown. Did you, we the, let me interrupt you. Did you say that with, with preferred plan, there's less commercial on the, which is apparent by the red, I guess? Uh, and did you make a statement, so, if I understood you correctly, that we that you're not limiting residential growth with the preferred plan? No, there's no, there's no. But, that, so, yeah, it, so that it, would it, lead one to believe then there would be less services, commercial services, under the preferred plan. Would that be correct? There would be less commercial services in the outlying areas. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question just yes. for clarity? You're saying, to me I'm saying that the residential would be the same. Is that correct? Uh, essentially, yeah, the, 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 the single family residential. Yes. Yeah, they, they put, essentially it's the same. Right. Okay. All right. On the west side. Right. Okay. Is, is there a, uh, some kind of um, outline of what each one of these colors represents uh, somewhere in our little report? Yeah, you should have got, I apologize, you should have got a legend that shows what legend. those land uses are, but I can go through them real quickly to, to let you know that the, the green is, uh, is rural residential. It's, it's, it, it, rural residential under the general plan basically includes three land use ca or zonings and that range from uh, half acre lots to one dwelling unit per acre to one dwelling unit per two and a half acres. That's the range within within the uh, non-urban residential or what we call uh, rural residential. The orange color is uh, UR or urban residential and it includes uh, a range of zonings R7000, R10000, and R15000. The red, of course, is commercial. The green uh, is really open space, so it could be a number of things. It could be parks. It can be, uh, in, in this case, a cemetery. Uh, it can be uh, drainage basins, a, a number of, of open space type facilities. Um, the blue uh, are facilities, public facilities, and in this case, includes school site, and, and this big blue area is shown up here is the, is the, the prison, state prison site. And the brown, there's two different shades of brown. I don't know if you can see them. I'm trying to pick them out here. Right up here you can see them. There's a dark brown and a lighter brown color. The dark brown color is HDR. It's a, or, or what we call MR2. It's a higher density uh, multiple family zone. Generally, it allows for a range, a density of 15 to 30 acres, uh, 30 units per acre. And the, the lighter brown color is, is um, MR1, which allows for basically a density of 7 to 15 units to the acre. And I think that pretty much covers the range of land uses under the general plan that are shown there. Can you repeat? Yeah, MR1 is, is basically 7 to 15. Yeah. Other questions regarding this slide? This, um, I'm seeing a color, oh, okay, that's my mistake, yeah. And, did you say green twice? It was just uh, the green, green well, there's control. two green colors on it. The green, there's kind of a, uh, oh. a lime green down here, which is the open space designation on, on okay. this map. And then there's this color here, which is more of a, uh, not really forest, it's, no, a darker green color. 
That's that's non-urban residential. Okay. Can you non-urban urban residential? So essentially, the urbanizing area, the the, the demarcation between um, non-urban and urban residential is right here. It's shown right here. On, in this area of the plan on the west side. And that's all we're looking at right now, just the west side of the plan. Okay. Other questions on this slide? Okay, now we go, this is the central area. It extends from 40th Street West to Division Street and from Avenue H down to Avenue L. Again, on the left-hand side is the no project alternative. The middle uh, map is the balanced land use alternative, and the uh, map on the right is the GPAC preferred plan. And really the, the, the major difference between the two alternatives, between the two alternatives and no project here, is the addition of the mixed use land to this map. And if you look at first the balanced land use plan, you can see where these areas are. They're kind of a pink color here, over here, and in the downtown area, in this area um, um, east of Sierra Highway. And then in addition to, the, uh, to those, to the addition of those on the balance plan, um, um, there were also some other uh, moderate changes some uh, uh, higher density multiple family here with some new commercial sites at I and uh, 40th Street West. Um, um, in addition here uh, at uh, 30th Street West and, and Avenue K across from the college, south of the college. Uh, we're showing the Amagosa Creek area on this map, right in this area, project area. It's north of L, and on the east side of, uh, of 10th Street West. And then, of course, it's also showing some additional master plan park sites. And essentially, those are the changes between the balanced plan and the no project. Some, uh, some of those are general plan revisions that have already been approved by the by the city and in, included within the um, yes. preferred yeah. plan, so those are... Existing conditions. Right, there are a few of them are. Right. Uh, a couple of them are. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And can I ask on the balanced land use um, sure. north of Avenue L at 40th? Is that just a printer thing, or is that because it's a different color? You north see how it's kind of uh, it's like oh, it's right, right here. Yes. Now, thanks for pointing it out. Yeah, that is a glitch. Okay. Actually, that's the prime desert woodland area, and for some reason the computer didn't color this. So they're precisely the same. There's no so changes. There's no changes being proposed on those. It just came out for some reason a different color. Okay, thank you. We'll we'll correct that. Woodland. Then, if you go to the, uh, the the map on the far right, the GPAC preferred plan for this area. Again, this is Central Lancaster. Uh, you see that that on the preferred plan, the the mixed use additions, the, the recommendations on the preferred plan are are, are quite more extensive than the balanced growth. You have a large area here, which is just uh, uh, south of Foxfield. Um, again, the same area here. And this area is the same. But we have also, uh, within the, around the hospital area, uh, have added in uh, mixed uh, use areas around the hospital. And this, again, is in areas of infill land that are currently available for, for development. So these are where these mixed use um, um, Land use designations are being proposed to be added to the general plan. Um, also, uh, it's a little hard to see, but right down in here, there were some changes that occurred where, where some mixed use was added in. This would be south of the college uh, at, uh, at 30th and L, and also some additional multiple family in that area there. And again, the idea behind the preferred plan is that you're increasing through the mixed use designations primarily, you're increasing the potential for density and, and intensity of land uses within the central core because under the preferred plan, you would anticipate there would be a larger population, the core of your population would be located in this area. Whereas under the, the balanced plan, that population would be more spread out. 
Under the no project alternative, it would be much more spread out because you're dealing mostly with single family residential under that, under that alternative. But that essentially is the changes uh, between the three alternatives in the central area. Again, they're not extensive and, and, and pre predominantly they, they, they are adding in the new mixed use designation within these areas. Questions regarding this, this area? Oh, I'm using my pointer again. Here we go. On the east side, the east side of the city, uh, we're going from Division to 40th Street East and from Avenue H down to Avenue L. And uh, probably of all three areas, this is where the least amount of change occurred. Uh, predominantly because much of the land uses in this area are pretty well determined. And so it was um, more of a challenge to, to, to be able to go in and, and look for where you could find usable infill and um, also um, where you didn't have a residential, a single family residential pattern already established. Uh, predominantly, um, the changes that, that uh, occurred that, that are recommended under the two alternatives uh, are really uh, consist of either cleanup items along the, uh, uh, the, the uh, what we call the uh, Avenue I corridor. Yeah, the stretch here. And um, uh, the addition of some, uh, under the balance growth alternative of a few commercial sites here. Also an increase of this commercial site at Lancaster Boulevard and 40th Street West that was an area that enabled the increase of that commercial site by some, some number of acres. And uh, with the, um, and then uh, there's also a master plan, new master plan park site here. Um, and then under the uh, GPAC preferred plan, pretty much it's the same thing with the exception that additional multiple family was added here. Uh, but pretty much the commercial sites uh, are, are the same between the two, two alternatives, between the balance and the GPAC preferred plan on both of these, uh, on bo in, in this area on both of the plans. So very, very, very moderate changes on the east side. So overall you can see that, and that's a fast review, uh, and I understand that, and there, you know, there will be, I mean, we're other opportunities to go delve into this this map in much greater detail. But what I really want to try to accomplish tonight is just give you an idea of the differences between the three maps, and really to show that that, that, that overall uh, th this update is not really um, 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 there's not massive land use uh, changes occurring under any of these alternatives. The major change that's occurring is that we're adding the mixed use land use designation, which is, would be new to the general plan, and primarily adding that to the uh, the central area of Lancaster, and at the same time, try, at the same time, trying to balance some of the outlying areas of the urbanizing area, so that it will accommodate development better and and uh, allow. A uh, better balance of land uses in those areas, and that was really what was missing off the, of the '97 general plan when it was adopted. On the um, before you go to that one, okay. On the previous one um, was the um, APZ zones considered uh, south of uh, K on the. Preferred plan or the the APZ zones, the accident, accident potential zone. Um, yeah, you I mean that, that's actually I think that actually the only place that comes in. Um, this is what you're referring to, Plan 42, right? Further east. Yeah, it comes in further east. Uh, the reason I didn't show that area is that there are no changes being proposed at all. The APZ zone hasn't changed. It didn't change how, between. How about the, the AQ then? How about the noise impact over the? Uh, between K and or yeah, the noise actually the, the when we did when we did the um, when the uh, Air Force did uh, the uh, ACU study back in 1990, I believe it was around the time of the 90 they general plan. There were ago. there were some concerns about uh, noise from aircraft uh, because you had the 65 CNEL line that actually came up into this area here. Uh -huh. 
and it wasn't considered. In fact, that was one of the reasons that the city went back at that time and did a lot of work in this area to redesignate this and put it into lower density residential uses that were more acceptable as an interface with the Air Force Base. Uh, when they updated the ACU study in 2000, uh, those, those 65 CNAL lines were actually pulled back somewhat. Uh, and they don't affect that area the same way. However, there's something called the overflight area where you have a lot of aircraft that pass over this area. They basically do this kind of a thing. And so you still have a lot of aircraft activity, uh, and that area continues to be a concern with regard to ur uh, urban density encroachment on the base. So that's one thing the city remains concerned the about. The lines are still going to be added to the... The, where the, even though they've been pulled back, they still impact the properties between L and M, right? Well, there's there's some. I don't know if the 65, the 65. There may be some impact right in this area here, but I don't think they go too much into this area anymore. South of L, they do. Yeah, south, yeah, south of L. Yeah. Yes. Which is still part of. Yeah, like in, in this in this area here. Right. It's not shown on the map. They go, the, the city goes down to M right in this area here. You're right. Yes, they do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding this side, on the east side? Okay. I want to show one more area, and the reason I haven't shown, there are areas of the, the plan I haven't shown, and I haven't shown those areas because nothing happened in them. They're, they're exactly the same as the mill project. The east side, the far east side, the, the, there's, a, there's a, a chunk of land that goes down below Avenue L. Well, actually, it's a chunk that goes all the way to Avenue N. There's nothing proposed to change in on any of the alternatives, so that's not shown. Uh, however, I did want to focus on this area for a second because there were some modifications that are recommended under in this area of the, of the general plan. And essentially, this is from 110th Street West to uh, 80th Street West from Avenue F down to Avenue I, and this is the area that's referred to as the Del Sur area. And the large orange colored area right here is actually the, the Del Sur proposal. And it shows, it's showing the various uses, of this is the residential designations, the commercial sites, and some of the various other uses that are within that proposal. And this is the, some of those remnant pieces that I talked about earlier on that were left behind uh, after the adoption of the 97 general plan when we pull, when the city pulled back the, the urban uh, residential boundaries and re reverted that area back to rural residential. These were left because there were various entitlements on these properties. Uh, however, there were a couple, there's a couple of areas here that, uh, that were determined to be, we believe, staff believe, as, as, as really not necessary to maintain as urban residential. So under the, uh, both of the alternatives, the balanced growth alternative and the GPAC preferred plan, we're, met, right, we're recommending that those also be uh, reverted back to uh, rural residential. And I'll point those out where they are. One of the areas is right here. And this is up about Avenue. It goes from about Avenue F to Avenue F8. And it's out near... About 105th Street West, and the other area is right here, which is uh, um, again about 105th Street West, and just on the, the the north side of Avenue H. And you can see on both of the alternatives, those are being proposed uh, as non-urban residential. Those two, and other than. Uh, the addition of park sites of, that were added under the master plan, those are the only changes being proposed in those areas to the two alternatives. A couple of comments you, on the uh, legend between the second and third map near Alphabet, Street Alphabet, as needs to be addressed. Yes. Ours. Yeah, I apologize for that. That's a real big deal. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, there are there is a uh, a portion within the city, a portion within the county, about 65 acres of public facilities on the north side of G between um, 92nd and 95th, which is uh, should be blue 
I think you got a uh, letter comment on that, so that ought to probably be included. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Any other questions on these these comparisons? Yeah, these are pie, pie charts uh, of the three alternatives. The no project alternative, balanced request alternative up in the upper right uh, uh, hand corner, and then the preferred plan, uh, the GPAC preferred plan, uh, uh, the lower one. And again, look at you, just looking at these three, it's just another way of looking at this, but looking at the distribution of land uses under the three alternatives, you really see that the, the major difference is the addition of, of the mixed use. The mixed use is this color right here. That really is the major difference between these alternatives. And commercial. A little bit of commercial, but but really the, the change that is occurring is the addition of the mixed use. That's the biggest, that affects most of the land under either of the alternatives is that, that particular designation. And we will get you that legend so that you know what all these colors mean. I apologize for that. And this is just a, a bar graph that shows the uh, land use alternatives, each of the land use alternatives, and it shows those three areas that we just examined, west side, urban, uh, I'm calling the urban corner, the central, central Lancaster, and east side, and it shows uh, density in units per acre. And this is density in units per acre, at 2030, it's not build out. It's what the population that would supposedly exist at that time. And you can see really again the major change uh, is really within the the central Lancaster, the urban core. And really, with regard to number of units, uh, you're only talking about a couple of different you know units per acre between the no project and the preferred plan. And the reason that is is because you're not building out the general plan by that time. You still have additional land left over under the preferred plan, to uh, and so you're not uh, you're not seeing a, a, a big difference in density between between these between the alternatives. This last graphic is a population comparison between the three alternatives and the, again these three areas, and pretty much the same thing. If you look at if you look at the uh, west side, um, the three bars that represent the west side, which is the light orange color, they're pretty much the same. The population is pretty much the same. Uh, and the darker orange color, uh, the east side, again, there's not a lot of difference. And the real difference is occurring within that central area because more of the population is lo locating under the preferred plan under the no project. And that, that completes the presentation that I had uh, on the, um, the alternatives. And I'll open this up for discussion and um, comments from the audience when you get ready for that. Appreciate your comments, and there may be some questions. Okay. I don't know if everyone's asked. Ready? Um, previously, when uh, closing out, I don't know if we've closed out the uh, policy document at this point. However, uh, as was stated on our agenda, uh, we were going to complete the review of that. So when are we going to do that? Um, here. Um, we have a number of, of, of uh, items that, I, that, that need to be addressed, one of those being additional uh, review and comment of the policy document. And by no means, by the way, is this is close out review or discussion of the policy document. You can bring that back at any time you want to discuss that. But I think that we have enough material from you, and also there's a number of addendums there's an addendum that, that has a number of corrections that we already know have to be made to the policy document. Plus, on top of that, we have uh, quite a bit of information now on request letters for land use changes. And I think there's enough material that that would uh, actually compose a meeting of its own. Right. And we have a couple of opportunities to do that. Uh, 
the way this, 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 this process is, is, is moving forward at this time is that, as we mentioned, we have a 60-day review period for the, the, pro, uh, the Program Environmental Impact Report, which will begin today, and I'll go through the end of January. And then in February, staff is going to be working to respond to comments, working with the consultant to respond to comments, and pull everything together to get ready for the actual public hearings, which quite possibly could start in March of next year before the Planning Commission. And so we have the opportunity for additional special meetings. We're going to have one meeting on um, January 6th to receive comment on uh, the, the draft uh, PEIR. And uh, that probably will not take all the evening to do that. So there's the opportunity to go into some of this, you know, further review of the policy document and the land use map that night. We can also arrange and look at having a, uh, another special meeting towards the end of January to continue the discussions in order to give you a level of comfort before we go into the, to the actual public hearings. And there may be even an opportunity to do something in, in February also before the start of the public hearing. So there are other opportunities. At this time, I think staff needs a little bit more time to organize all of this and get it ready to bring it back to you before we're ready to, to discuss. I appreciate that. I mean, uh, I know some of our comments, uh, our written comments, uh, were not received by staff until last Monday and with the holiday period. Uh, you know, we didn't. I don't think any of us expected, you know, it to be put in a in a format that we could review tonight. However, um, I do think, for at least from my chair, uh, that the concerns expressed by members verbally uh, at various times in the meeting, as well as what was written, at least uh, the couple that I've seen, uh, raise issues that will impact uh, land use the land use uh, designation, certainly. So I, th I think we need to get our arms around that and, and be comfortable with that um, before we start uh, making any suggestions of changes to any of the maps, if in fact any of that ever happens. I, you know, who knows what will happen. We also need to hear the public's comments tonight, and, and we do have folks here that I'm sure that'll, that want to speak, and that's great. However, um, I, I do, th you know, the policy, policy document is the guide, and if we are changing uh, some of the policies and some of the action items, it uh, will have a great impact, I think, on, on the document. Wouldn't you agree? On the uh, maps. Uh, it could. So we have scheduled tonight for uh, the general plan review we have January 6th we also I think have reserved January 26th as a special potential special meeting night as well so it's likely we would use that it sounds like wouldn't yeah you? I, I think it's important to note too um, you know what we've gone over with you is is the three basic land use land use scenarios tonight um, ultimately staff still has recommendations that it's going to need to carry forward to you that that um, you know may not may not line up exactly with with the GPACs preferred preferred land use plan um, and as I we indicated I think way back in August or September when we started this this is yet another one of those inputs that you're getting that ultimately you as a commission are going to have to take and craft a recommendation to the to the city council with so yes there's there's still a lot more but um, obviously um, I, I think this is a pretty good rundown of, of you know the, the the basic scenarios that are analyzed in the EIR and uh, you know also kind of form the basis certainly the staff would would build from in terms of any recommendations it's going to make so then, um, since we have the program environmental impact report, um, uh, minor adjustments to the policy document as well as to the map would likely not have a ma have a major impact on the uh, yeah. on the EIR program EIR not, unless not it's from major our perspective. Because the program EIR addresses the preferred plan, correct? 
And it's written in support of that, I guess you would say, right? It, it looks at that as the, as the uh, you know, preferred, likely preferred alternative, one. likely one. But you are correct. At, at a programmatic level, um, there's still, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but there's certainly still area for, for um, flexibility. You know, flexibility within, within the ultimate land use map. And, and I would tell you, in some of the discussions I've had with the, with the Citizens Advisory Committee members individually, um, if they look at that that preferred plan, um, I don't think that any of them will tell you they necessarily agreed with every single land use on every single site. What they did say, however, was that it appeared to be the best direction that they thought the planning effort ought to go. Very good. Um, since the uh, program environmental impact report process was published and the uh, review period begins tonight, uh, we don't have to take any action other than to announce it, which we've done. And it's been published in the newspaper and it's available in the library and City Hall and all the other places where you typically can get a copy and review it. It's also on the website. I believe it's on the website it is, also. Yeah, yes, it is. And you provided us with a written document as well as a, as a CD of the, of the document, which we appreciate. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments from members before we get into public testimony? All right. Shall we have public testimony then? This portion of the agenda allows an individual the opportunity to comment on the general plan revision only. Any person who would like to address the Planning Commission on the general plan revision is requested to complete a speaker's card for the recording secretary. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. So, do we have any speaker cards? I have none, but if there are people that wish to speak, they can simply fill one out after they're done. We just want to make sure we have a record of who's speaking. begin with the first one that I've gotten, uh, Albert Pra. Mr. Pra, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the Commission, my name is Albert Pra. I am uh, CEO of Landstone Communities, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Lancaster Highlands, which is a 1,600-acre assemblage on the west side um, of the of the community, it is bounded uh, by Avenue L on the north, Avenue M on the south, 80th Street west on the east, and 110th Street west on, uh, on the west side. About two thirds of the property is located within the city of Lancaster and is currently designated with the zone of UR or NU, and about a third of it is in the county, which will ultimately uh, get annexed into the city. Uh, my purpose in speaking here tonight is uh, to propose a revision to the GPAC Preferred Land Use Plan. Um, I previously have sent a couple of letters to you uh, on, on that subject. I have some extras here if, uh, if it's appropriate. And I don't want to repeat what's in the letter, and, I, uh, and I'm listening and I'm seeing that there's going to be some further discussion in terms of the policies and perhaps on the land use. but. I want to share with you just a couple of thoughts about uh, that plan. Um, what we would like to see is a specific plan overlay designation on the preferred plan. And that would simply be a planning tool that will allow us to submit to the city a specific plan for the overall planning and ultimate development of the 1,600-acre assemblage. Um, obviously, a specific plan overlay does not in and of itself approve a specific plan, and it won't increase any of the existing density under the current general plan. It will only give us the ability to submit a specific plan and work with the city, with the staff, uh, to, I believe, accomplish the very policies that you have considered as part of your general plan update. 
I think the specific plan would be a good planning tool. Uh, it will draw on the housing element that you just finished reviewing and that will allow the city to consider or in fact require different lot sizes, different housing products, as well as prescribe the designs and other issues concerning the safety and welfare of the community. Um, for example, your policy 1815 in the new general plan upda update calls for a variety of housing products and lot sizes in urbanizing areas. And this property is in an urbanizing area to allow feathering of densities. So this is an example of how a specific plan can help implement the very, the very policies that you have uh, already considered. And then finally, I think it will also allow us to create a sustainable community, which is very important to everybody. So very good. Thank, thank you. And thank you for your comments. And uh, I know we had previously noted that we had received correspondence from you uh, in this matter. So appreciate your comments. Thank you. Any questions from the members? All right. We have another speaker, Mr. Ludicky. Nicole Parson. Uh, Ms. Parson. change what um, I was going to speak about tonight since we sort of changed the meeting tonight. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and highlight um, some some um, s um, subjects that maybe that t to reiterate that make sure that they get added is into the general plan. Is that okay? Or um, revisions? We're talking about revisions? Or would it? Okay. Um, um, there's one thing where um, Mr. I guess it was I don't, there's no way that I mean to bring it forth, but can I have more than three minutes? Can I please? You go right ahead with your comments, please. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Okay, I'll just, I'll just start with this one. This is the original um, that I, um, okay, the general plan, um, 2030, um, the, this objective, um, my portion, um, is objectives are um, help, hope, and happy place. Um, a happy place, health, home, and to harness of history. The summary summary is to constitute continuous, unified, catastrophic breed and breadth of life and libert lib libertarian appropriation, drinking water, health, and rule to govern, comprehensive, complex environmental concerns, views, and future mineral of commerce, orders of rightful freedom, enjoyment, fu enjoyment futures now, um, that's for um, the next generation. Um, we have state of all levels of joint expertise, injections, and efforts are hereby in accordance with his history and are as human superior sovereignty to perceive history and pre um, assess allies are one are of one general clan of commonwealth. I stand before you today with the next tier to our life narrative above summer. However, this is, can you guys not beat, let me, beat me, please? I mean, just for this meeting? It's please. automatic. It gives you another 30 seconds. How, however, this, as all, okay, well, the alternative without alternative, there is no alternative without this alternative. This has been adopted and as a dream. My vision, our home, However, the alternative is to sit and do nothing apart 
or the right things together. All right, thank you for your comments. Okay, you too. Another speaker, Mr. Ludicky? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Alex Baharlo. Mr. Baharlo, is it? Yes. Welcome. Good evening, members of the Commission. Uh, I spoke before you about a few months ago. Um, uh, I represent Delsa Ranch LLC, and uh, I, I thought it would, even though I didn't plan on speaking tonight, I thought it would be appropriate since one of the slides pointed to the Delsa area. And uh, again, our request is uh, that one of the areas that were down zoned uh, from urban residential to non-urban residential um, was presented tonight as, a, as a, uh, a parcel of land in the outskirts and I want to bring to your attention that again those were those parcels of land are really parts of the phasing of Del Ranch LLC which there's a Del Ranch community which is an approved entitled um, uh, Vesta tenant of track map with uh, 2,000 units and uh, it's planned that way. The streets uh, run from Del Sur Ranch uh, to these two parcels, the street pattern, and the housing pattern does the same. And we're also considering the costs that are associated with developing Del Sur Ranch to be distributed with the additional units that we would get with these two parcels of land that are now down zoned. Uh, so again, I come before you tonight to ask you to reconsider uh, those two parcels that were pointed out tonight as, uh, as not being down zoned uh, for that reason and, if, uh, and, and I'm asking you to look at it as part of Del Sur Ranch uh, proper and not uh, parcels of land that are on the outskirts. Thank you. Okay, just to be clear, it's, there's no down zoning involved here with the recommendation as I understand it. The recommendation is from urban to non-urban, okay? Zoning takes place after the general plan is adopted. All right. Correct. Very good. But Thank it would you. allow for less. Okay. Just, just right. so we're clear. Yes. Very good. Thank That's you. Right. Mr. Chairman, I'd also point out he has submitted a, a request letter, and you will get the opportunity to review. I think, I think we've had part two, of certainly two, maybe more. Very good. All right. Do we have another speaker? Uh, Doug Burgess. Mr. Burgess, did you say? Yes. Welcome. I won't take long. I just had to introduce myself. I'm with the Court Hill Town Council. I was there 15 years ago and started it and kind of got involved in stuff at that time. Anyhow, uh, what I really want to do is tell us we'll probably submit some stuff as far as Court Hill on concerns. We just received the uh, environmental report today. So it came in Friday and I got it today. Uh, one of the concerns I had way back was the high density around the prison for everybody in that area. You, if you go there on a, on a visitation day and you see the cars that are visiting the prisons, the people in the prison, if you continue to have, and you cut it back on the preferred quite a bit, as I see, uh, it, it would be a real holding place for a lot of problems. You know, they'll start living there and, and instead of driving to visit, they're, they're, we're bringing that element. And, and I, I'll, I'll kind of drop it on that. And I have a few questions on commercial, but I don't want to get into that now. And I think we submitted writing probably a little, little better shot with it. But I appreciate your time. Thank you. Very good. Whatever you prefer, you can give verbal comments or you can write to us and you can do both. Whatever you prefer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any other speakers? I have no other slips, Mr. Chairman. No other. All right. conclude then the staff's uh, report tonight? Yes, staff has nothing more to add. All right, very good. So the next item on the agenda is the director's announcements. Probably I've, I've already covered most of them. The, the next meeting on January 6th, I just want to reiterate for everyone who's here, uh, Mr. Burgess indicated that they received a copy of the EIR. Um, that is an opportunity to provide both oral and written comment on that document. Uh -huh. It's not the only opportunity, but it is an opportunity. That's certainly. The comment period closes 60 days from today. 
Uh, yeah, Dave, that's January 31st. Okay. I noticed in your, in your report you mentioned that the end of the comment period, then you would anticipate then a uh, possible certification hearing within 30 days. I'm, I would be surprised if uh, responses to comments could be prepared in that 30-day period and we'd be in a position in March to do that. I mean, I, that, that's pretty aggressive for a document of this size. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It, I, all I was referring to is that, the, that there's a possibility that we could begin right. uh, the public hearing process in March, and we're going to try everything we can to do that. To the statute gives us, well, you're giving yourself 60 days for public review and then, and then response to comments, but you know, certain state agencies are notorious in being late with comments. And we tend to respond to them even if they are late and those kinds of things. So Very true. So we're, it'll be April or May probably before we get into any certification, I would imagine. Huh? Uh, it would be um, uh, probably more likely to enable uh, that the, uh, the, the uh, uh, public hearing process would start for your consideration on the general plan. Very good. Okay. All right. Any of the commissioners have any uh, comments? Anything they want to? Add to next month's agenda, next week's agenda. Yep. All right. It's now time for public business from the floor on non-agendized items. This portion of the agenda allows an individual the opportunity to address the commission on any subject regarding city business. Under state legislation, no action can be taken on non-agenda items. Members of the public should be aware that this uh, of this when addressing the commission regarding items not specifically referenced on the agenda. Any person, person who would like to address the Planning Commission is requested to complete a speaker's card for the recording secretary. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. Do we have a speaker? I have one card, Mr. Chairman, but, but you're going to have to see whether or not the subject matter is, in fact, the general plan. If it is, then it's not Sorry, proper. No. You're going to have to see whether or not the speaker's subject is in fact the general plan. If it is, then I don't think it's a proper public business from the floor item. Not at this time, no. No, but uh, it's Nicole Parson. Ms. Parsons? Oh. Okay, so Nicole Parsons, Planning Commission. Okay, this is not a regular public hearing. Um, I'm planning commission meeting. This is a general plan meeting. Yeah, the comments tonight at this point would be on any subject other than the general plan. Any subject other than the general plan, no okay, general. Fine. Um, so you got you have three minutes. So go ahead. Okay. Um, there's there's this thing that um, for maybe I don't know if you'd include this in to the general plan, but um, for like our children because I don't think there's anything in there for them, and um, and just for like just teaching some type of respect. I don't know what um, the new president is doing, but he said that he wanted he was trying to do something about um, children and the way that they're brought up and um, and I and so I noticed also that we didn't have anything but um, you know when you there's a whole group of men and there's just like one woman you know maybe we could like teach our kids you know just to address that one woman first or something and then also um, I'm um, I'm doing this thing about um, um, I have a, a theory of um, um, global warming but um, it's it's um, it's for all levels of government and it's um, a method and me mechanism um, for a, a range uniform um, collaboration so we might that's what we had to start looking at and then also when I started back at 2006 with the general plan um, there was um, um, because the, the business the, the way there was it was a waste business and um, I'm just going to read a little bit um, and the reason I started back then with it, it because there, there was a whole bunch of taboo um, subjects and um, and so and um, permitting and just to you know bypass some of um, the red tape. That's why um, it was started and um, probably included into the general plan along with the water. But the water the water was actually changed um, to it, it wasn't conservation back then. It was. Uh, um, um, just it wasn't conservation back then but so but I, I changed my um, proposal what I was is waste and wastewater um, specialist back then um, so as California 
continues to grow, the population um, so in population so well on waste and the reusable materials are necessarily entering the landfills. There is around 33 um, state desirable recyclable materials um, plus, well, a, a better way is um, taking a look at recycling um, and, and the way that it's um, synonymous with dumpsters. Um, but um, also, um, the, the water, the plumbing, um, it, the um, IR, Integrated Waste Regional Water Plan, um, that was um, suppo supposedly, um, the letter that was sent was by my office to um, the Assembly and to um, government officials and well, because it was supposed to be for a regulational um, index and um, to re replenish water assurance and to preserve the natural resources and also the waste um, in in activity and inability um, to, to conserve on our own. And thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you, Chair. Mr. Ludicky, any further public? I have no other speakers' cards, Mr. Right. Chairman. So, uh, without any other business from the members, um, we stand adjourned then to Monday, December 8th, 2008, at 5.30 p.m. in the Planning uh, Department's large conference room here at City Hall for our monthly briefing. Thank you.